Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to you uh, from uh, Geneva. Uh, we are really delighted to have uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, with us today. Uh, welcome, Prime Minister, for this very special conversation, which will be followed by an interaction uh, with key business leaders. Today... Well, it's good to be with you. Please. Go ahead. No, 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 thank you. Uh, I w wanted also to mention, Prime Minister, that today is the Holocaust Memorial Day, and uh, we especially appreciate your presence here on such a day that uh, has such a historical uh, importance, but uh, it's also about never forgetting. Mr. Prime Minister, your contribution to the Davos Agenda today uh, builds on your long-standing partnership with the Forum. We have had the pleasure to have you for our annual meeting, the, the physical one in Davos, uh, regularly over the past few years. And we also have launched together with your government and under your leadership a center for the fourth industrial revolution of the World Economic Forum in Israel. And um, you have also made uh, huge and very important contributions to our Great Reset Dialogue series recently. Prime Minister, um, you have now been uh, at the helm of uh, the Israeli government for more than a decade. No other Prime Minister in the history of Israel has had this position as long as you. And no, you're also steering your country during the challenging COVID-19 pandemic. So I think um, many of uh, the viewers and partners of the forum would really like to know how you see the coming months in Israel and the world when it comes to the pandemic. When it comes to vaccination, I think uh, you know vaccinated more than 70% of you people above 60 years old. I don't think anyone can then uh, show um, the same kind of results. So please share with us because you are also still in a lockdown situation and, and the next steps. Prime Minister, floor is yours and welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be with you, Brenda, and with uh, your uh, audience. Uh, actually, uh, we have uh, uh, vaccinated 82% uh, of our um, uh, about 60, and it's not enough. We have to vaccinate, uh, get them at least to 95%, which was a big task, but that's about the residual of those who really oppose uh, vaccines. It's about 5%, so we should be able to, and I intend to get it up there for, further. If um, uh, you ask what's the challenge, we're in an arms race, except it's not an arms race, it's a race between vaccination and mutation. The mutations, uh, especially the British mutation, but there'll be more mutations. There are more mutations, there'll be more mutations in the future. Uh, means that we have to race as fast as we can to vaccinate the uh, first the risk groups in the population and then everyone else uh, in, in order to give immunity and then probably expect the uh, uh, companies that are producing the vaccines at this point to modify their vaccines to accommodate the mutations that they don't cover now as they develop. And then we'll have to purchase them. Uh, that's going to be our life uh, for the uh, uh, coming years. I don't think that we're going to uh, uh, evade that, but we can overcome it. Uh, the reason we did uh, well in Israel is one, because we purchased a lot fast. Um, didn't quibble about the price. I personally got involved in it. Uh, and I said just basically to the bureaucrats, uh, cut the uh, whatever. I want to be diplomatic, so cut the nonsense. <laughs> Please uh, feel free to, uh, uh, to share with us very candidly. So, Well, cut the C word in English <laughs> or any other yeah. word that you want. I mean, this is ridiculous, you know? You'll pay a few more uh, dollars uh, per dose now. Tomorrow, everybody will be paying 10 times that much. So number one, that. Number two, uh, the legal people. Um, I actually was on the phone with uh, the president of, uh, with the CEO of Pfizer, Albert Bourla. Uh, I think at two o'clock in the morning, he put his legal advisor on, I put our legal advisor on, and we crashed it. So you need personal leadership to move it. And basically the selling point was a real one, turns out to be true that Israel could serve as a, a world laboratory for uh, uh, herd immunity or something approaching herd immunity very quickly. Uh, because we have an efficient distribution system, we proved that uh, with uh, four HMOs that are at once competing and cooperating with each other. It's a unique system. Uh, that's why we have actually the, I think the lowest, the highest uh, uh, 
the highest life expectancy almost in the world with one of the lowest frequencies of diseases at the minimal cost, about 8% of GDP. And it's a lot to do with this system that combines competition uh, and uh, social security uh, floor that protects every citizen. So 98% of our citizens have digital records in these HMOs that go back 20 years. And we offered to share that with Pfizer and with all humanity uh, to understand what the effects of uh, mass inoculations are on subgroups, not individual information, that's nothing, no, nobody gets that. But statistical information that could prove very valuable. And the most important thing, I think, the most pressing thing is the question of what real degree, not only of personal protection do you get from vaccines, but what is the level of uh, preventing infections when you receive the inoculation? That's the critical uh, question, obviously, as you want to open the economy and restore life to normal. In short, we, I gave uh, uh, Pfizer the argument that they could benefit from the data that we could produce, uh, and they were convinced, and then we uh, we went along and, and did this. And in fact, our health system did exactly that. We have a digital, digitized uh, uh, system for distri distributing health, 1,400 sites in a very small country of 9 million, uh, and they just work it out. And again, on the distribution, uh, you know, I take, uh, say, I, I don't call them that much, five times a day, <laughs> I heard do. that you had been on the phone 70 times with the Pfizer uh, CEO. So. 21 times, not 17, oh. not 70, but 21 times. Okay. But also okay. I speak with Stefan Bansel of uh, Moderna. I've spoken to the heads of the other companies. I think you need uh, personal uh, leadership here. Uh, you know, it's like checking on munitions in a war. Uh, you really have to make sure you're getting, first of all, the, 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 the stock of vaccines. Then you have to make sure that they're distributed and they have to be distributed in a, basically in an optimized way that keeps changing, but we're doing that. Uh, so that's basically what we have done. And I think the important thing is not merely what we've done for Israel, but the fact that Israel can serve as uh, basically a global, really truly a global uh, test case, uh, not for uh, dangerous experiments, but to understand the, this safe experiment that we're carrying out what is the best way and what is the efficacy of uh, using, uh, using this, uh, this and later Moderna uh, uh, inoculation to uh, move the economies forward, to open up the economies, what risk are we taking, what's the infection rate and so on. So that, that's basically what we're doing. And I think, uh, I think a lot of countries will profit by it. No, thank you for that, and, and thank you for your leadership. But uh, one short follow-up question on something you said that, um, uh, of course, we are all concerned about now is the mutation. We have the UK piece, but we've also seen in Brazil and South Africa. It seems like uh, the current vaccines, uh, at least Pfizer, works okay with the UK, uh, UK variant, but we don't know yet on the others. But this also probably then shows, as you were alluding to, uh, Prime Minister, that we in the future will see different mutations and then we also have to adjust the vaccines. Do you foresee that when uh, this uh, COVID-19 is around, it's going to be uh, like the flu, so every fall you have to take an updated flu vaccine? Do you think it's going to stay around? And how are you prepared uh, for then adjusting the vaccines? And are you very worried that the new strains uh, will uh, not, the vaccines will not be worried, uh, won't work on the new strains, just uh, because well, it seems like you have gone very meticulously into this subject. Well, the answer to your first question is yes, I expect there will be, uh, uh, we'll have to inoculate ourselves uh, at least annually. That's my guess. I know I'm not completely sure, but that's if I had to guess yes, and I'm stocking Israel's uh, um, shelf, so to speak, with, uh, with vaccines, with that assumption. Uh, of course, um, you know, I, I want to sign contracts for future purchases based on the idea that the vaccines will alternate. For example, uh, they're now testing for children. And by the way, I think they should test in parallel several ages with reduced doses and not do a serial testing uh, system. And I spoke about that to uh, both uh, 
Abid Borla and Stefan Bansel, because I think you can cut a lot of time. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy in this stuff, and where you can cut time, you should. But as we proceed with either new vaccines or modified vaccines for mutations and modified vaccines for teenagers and children, then uh, I, I think we should uh, we should stock them and deliver them. And I expect this, yes, I expect this to be exactly like the flu, probably more so than the flu. That's the first thing. And will that... Uh, you asked, uh, I'm sorry, the second question was? It, it was also related to um, the, the effect, uh, uh, how effective the vaccines um, will be and are on the current uh, new strains from South Africa. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's just a question of time that you're going to get. Uh, right now, the vaccines, these two vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, are uh, overcome the various strains that uh, have appeared, that we know about, and that they've tested. Uh, but if you ask me statistically, it's just probabilistically, okay, it's just a question of time. And I'm not sure a lot of time, I'm not, don't pretend to be an expert on vaccines. Uh, but I think that from what I can ascertain from uh, talking to the, uh, the people who, who are experts in this, it's just a question of time before we hit a strain that uh, the current vaccines are not susceptible to it. And because of that, the risk that that would happen, I uh, shut down the airports. I'm the first country in the world to totally shut down commercial flights, totally. No commercial flights, nothing. If we have emergency flights, we have the Air Force or private carriers, but the idea of, and I'm shutting the land borders too. I'm just shutting it down because, uh, you know, what's the point? Uh, all, the, all the mutations that you see today, the South African, the British, the, uh, the Brazilian, and so on, <laughs> that's already too, you're two weeks too late. You know, they've already gone. And the new ones, you wouldn't know about for an another several weeks or whatever. So I've shut down the borders too, because I can do something that other countries, I think, would like to do too, and they might be able to do it. And that is to inoculate millions of people in the time that I close the country. And try to win the race between mutation and vaccination. Well, thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister. Um, we know that we have limited time, so I wanted to uh, go uh, now first to Stefan uh, Ushman, Chair and um, of the Executive Board and CEO of Merck. Uh, Stefan, are you with us? I think you're ready for asking a question to the Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Israel has such a vibrant innovation ecosystem, and I wanted to ask you a question that goes beyond the pandemic. Uh, my company, Merck, has been uh, in Israel for more than 50 years. We, we're working closely with many institutions. You know, like I, our friends at the Weizmann Institute or Hebrew University are like family members, uh, family members uh, uh, to us. And we have R&D centers in different businesses, in biopharma, in life science. In, uh, in, electronic, in electronic materials. Israel has, as I said, such a vibrant scene. You have more PhDs per capita than anywhere else. You have this incredible innovation network. You have high-ranking government officials rolling out a, a very clear policy. And we have so many things to tackle through science and technology within this pand pandemic and beyond the pandemic. Uh, I had the chance to discuss these topics with you together with Chancellor Merkel. Uh, could you tell us what would be your advice to other nations? How can we use science and technology to, to tackle these problems and do the, right, uh, do the right thing for our countries? What can we learn from Israel? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Oshman, for uh, your leadership and for uh, being involved with Israel because we appreciate it these cooperations um, enormously. Uh, I, th I think the key is uh, two things. Mo most people think it's education, and it is. Uh, that is the level of education, especially higher education, is critical. Uh, and we've had that all along. But that is a necessary but insufficient uh, 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 condition for the emergence of, uh, uh, of um, a high-tech uh, or innovative um, um, economy. I mean, the, the most important one, uh, and I would even put it before education, is free markets. You cannot really innovate in closed markets. 
So you have to give free markets and you have to, uh, you have to take certain risks uh, because some of that innovation in our case comes, uh, comes especially from the military. That's where we've had our stock of innovation, especially IT. Uh, we invest at some cost. We invest a, a huge uh, amount of our national resources on uh, uh, and maintaining um, effective intelligence. Uh, Israel is a small country, but it has a giant head. Giant. I mean, its collection agencies are, in the West, probably number two in size, absolute size. It's not the NSA, but it's not one fortieth of the NSA. That's our relative size compared to the United States. So that's an investment that goes annually all the time. And it produces people who coast the information networks, who develop uh, algorithms, who are in all sorts of uh, adjacent technologies. Uh, and that, and we take our best brain power to do that. So we literally canvass the whole country and we put our finest brains in these disciplines, these and other disciplines. So that's sunk cost. It won't go very far unless these people can, when they leave the military or the Mossad or wherever, uh, they can start their businesses. And if they, if they find a web of bureaucracy and ridiculously high taxes, which Israel had, for years, they'll go elsewhere. Like my brother-in-law was a pilot and a very gifted uh, high-tech guy who went to California and worked for this small company called Intel, you know. But his son is uh, one of the great, uh, you know, he's a young guy. He's going to be, he's in Israel now because the environment changed. We changed the environment. We made it uh, a very pro-business environment. We just uh, submitted to the Knesset the last one, which is absurd that we didn't have it, but you, Israeli uh, insurance uh, uh, funds and uh, pension funds could not invest, angel investment uh, in high tech was not possible. We just changed that. So everything you saw is still carrying a burden of bureaucracy, and that's our, our growth opportunity is our bureaucracy. Everything you see in Israel, this fantastic growth, has been done with the iron boot of bureaucracy, you know, holding down the spring of additional innovation. And the best growth uh, possibility that we have, and any country has, is just removing it and let the spring move out. You just get 10 years of growth for nothing, just by reducing these absurd uh, things. I'm telling you this because I chair very few uh, ministerial committees, defense and foreign affairs, that's clear. But um, I chair another committee, which is deregulation. And we move from being close to last place in the OECD, ne next to the last place uh, of the OECD. In five years, we moved 18 places because every two weeks I sit down with this regulation committee, I or a my director general, and we just clock, cut, clash, slash as much as we can. So I would say deregulate, open up your economies, uh, in addition to having uh, education, if you have you happen to require a military, make sure it's focused on uh, brains, brains before brawn. That's essentially the story of what Israel has done. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister. Fighting a red tape, but also uh, I looked at the numbers. I think uh, Israel is number one in the world when it comes to allocating FT um, to. Um, um, universities and also uh, different uh, education and free markets it really is so we, we have two uh, CEOs uh, to go so what I will suggest Prime Minister with your permission that we will take the two questions from the CEOs and then you can answer and and will uh, also be on Swiss uh, time the first question is quite historic though because it's uh, also part of the Abraham Accord, we have a leading CEO uh, from the UA with us. Uh, so good to see you, uh, Hadim Aldaray, uh, Vice Chair and Co-Founder of Aldara Holding. Uh, welcome. Uh, a year ago, I guess I wouldn't necessarily have seen you uh, in this session together uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu. So uh, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Borghe. Uh, your Excellency, thank you very much for your enlightening words. Um, if we learn a lesson from this pandemic is the importance of medicine and food. And when we talk about food, I think uh, we must address a very uh, long lasting uh, issues, which is water and uh, environment. Your Excellency, as you know, water is the most important natural resource for the continuity and sustainability of life 
for human and for food production. Many countries are suffering from water scarcity and shortage, also from the pollution of its own resources, which makes potable water is even scarcer. As a, as a consequence, many countries like yours have taken the initiative to develop plans, programs, and strategy aimed at preserving and developing water resources and preventing its contamination and pollution. Your Excellency, do you think that the ongoing efforts on this front are sufficient or we do need more efforts at the global level to address such challenge? How can an integrated global system help and preserve and develop the environment while reducing the impact of climate change and pollution on the millions of people affected? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Aldera. First, let me say that I'm, everyone in Israel is supremely delighted with the peace that we have. It's a warm peace uh, between the Emirates and Israel and Bahrain. Uh, it's just tremendous, uh, I have to say. And now Morocco and Sudan, uh, because it's a warm peace and it's going to be an economic, it already is an economic peace. We barely signed the documents and you know, the thousands, tens of thousands of Israelis went to uh, Dubai and the uh, Emiratis are coming to Israel and the business people are just <laughs> going bananas. They're doing fantastic deals. It's going to be great because, uh, because the Emirates uh, have proved to be, uh, as I've always seen them, uh, as uh, tremendously entrepreneurial and they're guided by a visionary leader, Muhammad bin Zayed. Sheikh Muhammad is a visionary leader. He understands the power of innovation and the power to dare, to dream. And so, uh, you know, he also dared and dreamed. We did this together to, to have this new kind of peace that is changing the relations between Israelis and Arabs. And I have to tell you, Arabs and Jews in Israel too. I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable what this is doing. So now to answer your question, uh, I think water is going to be a huge challenge and I think we can overcome it as uh, many other things with technology. I mean, it, it's almost like, uh, you know, why did, uh, why did the great uh, uh, forecasts uh, not work out on uh, the shortage of food, uh, uh, you know, and, and humanity's growth rate and so on? It turns out humanity did grow uh, an exponential rate, but, uh, but it turns out that food grew at a much ra greater rate because of technology. I mean, this is uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, the same thing is happening, can happen with water. It did happen in water in the case of Israel. I mean, we had we have a little less rainfall than we had at the founding of the state 73 years ago. Our population has grown tenfold. Our GDP is, and GDP per capita has multiplied. So we should have water scarcity. Now we should have water wars, and we have neither. Uh, what we have is we just make our water, or we save our water. We recycle about 90 percent of our wastewater which is first in the world, and the next one runner-up is Spain with about 20%, I think. So we recycle, recycling technology, key. Production technology of new water, key. Uh, we have, I think, the world's largest, one of the largest, perhaps the leading, uh, um, something you have in, in, in the Emirates as well, um, um, distillation, um, desalinization, desalination plants along the Mediterranean, and we're using solar technology, we intend to be a world leader, uh, the world leader in 10 years in producing solar energy. And so we can, we can desalinate water without using, uh, without unnecessary pollution. Uh, and these things are combined. So we have shown, we now have more water than we need. If we need more water, we make it. Since we, you can't make it at nighttime and in winter months, and you sometimes make more than you need in the summer, we're reverse, reversing uh, our supply from the Sea of Galilee, which we use to carry water down to the parts south of our country. We're actually pushing water back to the reservoir. We're pushing it in the other direction during the, uh, uh, the winter time. So I think these, these are creative things, how to prevent uh, leakage and so on from uh, water systems, pipes. You can, you can have, use technology, you can overcome the world's water problems. We are sharing this with countries from China to you name it. Uh, 
in South America, Africa. Uh, we, we share this technology gladly because I think we're, as, as Corona has shown us, we're all in one boat. Thank we're you. really in one boat. If we can plug the holes in the boat, we'll all be better off. Thank you. We, we're all glad that Malthus was terribly wrong and we support more crop per drop. We have one more question left. I don't want to have such a leader as Nikesh Arora, CEO and chair of Palo Alto Networks, uh, not having a chance to uh, come with his question. Uh, Nikesh, floor is yours. Thank you, Borg. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, you may not remember, seven years ago we met in Davos uh, and you told me how Israel uh, is a powerhouse in cybersecurity. And seven years later, I find myself running one of the largest cybersecurity companies in the world. Now, we've had a phenomenal cooperation uh, with Israel. We have some great people we've been able to work with, acquire. We have a very large team in Tel Aviv, so thank you very much for your leadership on that as well. You alluded to some of the reasons why, uh, even seven years ago and even recently with Stefan's question, on why you were able to turn Israel into a powerhouse on the cyber topic. With that becoming so topical today, with all the recent hacks you've learned about, uh, I'd love to get more, a little more elaboration on how you, how you will continue to develop that, one. And two, uh, given that we are a large, uh, you know, from our sense, one of our largest offices is Tel, Tel Aviv, talking about the cutting bureaucracy and moving you know, 18 positions up, we'd love to see you continue to move up that ladder so it makes life easier for us to be able to operate in Israel, but also would love to hear insights on how cybersecurity continues to be center stage in Israel. Well, Nikesh, I can tell you that I've already acted on your behalf, although I, I'm, I can't tell you that it was my first goal because I had immense pressure, immense pressure. Uh, after we developed uh, basically a very robust uh, cybersecurity uh, industry, uh, which meant basically allowing all these gifted people who leave, leave uh, our cybersecurity units to form their companies and partner with people like yourselves, your companies. We had immense pressure from the people whose job it is to protect our secrets to uh, begin to regulate cyber the way you regulate arms industry. And I uh, resisted it because I said that cyber is different because it's going to be affecting every single thing that we do because we're digitizing the world, it's clear. Uh, and, you know, as, as that goes up, cybersecurity requirements go up. And if we block that, we block a growth industry uh, and, and so on. So, so far I've held the line, I want you to know, <laughs> which is, is not, it's not easy. I'm, I'm doing my part. But uh, what we have done is uh, basically done that, avoid excessive regulation, enable our, the finest minds we have to go out and create their companies, which they do. Uh, and it's very robust. I, I think we're number two right now in the world in absolute formation of companies and capital investments in cyber. And we're a country of nine million people. Uh, and the other thing that we do is, um, and, and I think it's, it's important, is that sunk cost that I described to you of uh, our cybersecurity units and our information, our intelligence units, uh, we are moving to the south of the country and allowing uh, a whole, um, what you call in the jargon, ecosystem to develop around it, which basically says you just, you take uh, the military, you take the academy and you take the businesses and you put them in within, now listen to this, you put them within walking distance, walking distance. And I'm sure in Palo Alto, I don't know if it's walking distance <laughs> or jogging distance, but you actually, you think that's unimportant. It's amazingly important you know, to have that interaction so that, uh, you know, the fermentation takes place, allow foreign companies and governments to partake in this, uh, obviously within certain limits, but try to lower the limits uh, and, and keep your taxes low and keep your regulation low. That's basically what we're doing. Now that, that's for the industrial side of it, for the business side of it. I think that cyber presents new problems big problems. Um, I think the biggest problem is that uh, if you have real big actors, state actors, the problem of deterrence in cyber is different from the problem of deterrence in other forms of attacks. So the defense is somewhat more complicated. We took uh, a national 
defense agency uh, established it, gave it authority to regulate businesses and so on. And we, we really organized the question of defense, national defense, the Air Force, whatever, uh, critical facilities on the one side and, and businesses. This is a huge, I mean, this is conceptual. I think one of the most challenging things and you know, the most difficult, the most complex problem conceptually is to simplify a complex thing. So try to simplify it and give it clear foundations. Uh, but the defense against cyber attacks, especially state cyber attacks um, is complicated. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure I want to get into that, but I think that's becoming a big part in addition to cyber crime and, and, and everything else that you're fully familiar with. I guess uh, the attribution, that's yeah, the, please, go ahead. the problem. Please. The attribution piece is a, is a problem when you want to retaliate, isn't it? No, I think you know. I think you know. Uh, a lot of times, actually, you do know. But... Uh, then it gets into the question of mind games. You know, I, I, I don't want to start playing those games. You know, I'm, you know, I, I'm sort of off duty now. I'm doing this for a living every every day or so. You know, so I'd rather not get into that. But I think I think it's very challenging. Uh, the one thing I would say uh, to to deal with Nikesh's problem, the question, uh, it is not merely to not overregulate. If you have the investments already, we do all the time, but. The question is, how much do you want to direct your funding, state funding? I'm always resistant to that. You know, I don't usually direct. I worked in the Boston Consulting Group, so, you know, there was a, a, a case study there of actually doing a strategy for a country, and I, I felt very uneasy with that because I think the best regulator is market forces. It really allows you let the markets work and they'll usually choose better than you do. But we don't have a choice. Certainly in defense matters, we don't have a choice. Uh, and in cyber, really the investment, the most important investment you can make in cyber other than having the free economy that we need for any innovation, the most important investment you can make in cyber is mathematics. It's a lot of mathematics, a lot of mathematics. Uh, and I'm, I say mathematics and not just computation because I think mathematics is more important. And it's going to be more important as we move along uh, into other disciplines. Mathematics is it. So that's it. It's like I find myself like being in that, that uh, man in the film, The Graduate. Remember plastics? It's, it's mathematics. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, you know, we could have gone on uh, because it's fascinating to listening. I listened to you, but I remember when I was a young speechwriter in the parliament, uh, the person that I was writing the speeches for said, end before people want you to end, but, uh, and here we, we, we still could have continued. People wanted you to continue, Prime Minister, but I think we ended at a good time. Thank you for your answers and looking forward next year to see you back in, in the real Davos uh, in the winter. Thank you. Thank you, Borga. And I have to tell you, this was the most diplomatic cut off that I've heard. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.